All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the Boston Society for Architecture's Matter and Opinion Existing Buildings, a seven session series on climate action and building the will around building reuse. I'm Lori Ferris, the Director of Sustainability and Climate Action at Goody Clancy, a Boston architecture planning and preservation firm. I'm thrilled to be moderating our third session today. Uh, our focus today is on K-12 projects, both public and charter schools. And during the rest of the month, um, we will look further into higher education facilities, mission-driven workplaces, and housing, both residential and multifamily. Before we get any further, a huge thank you to our sponsor, the Spalding Brick Company. We could not do this programming without our sponsorship, so thank you so much. And thank you to our partners, AIA Central Massachusetts, for hosting the AIA New England Design Awards this year, AIA Connecticut, AIA Rhode Island, AIA Vermont, and AIA Western Massachusetts, the Boston Preservation Alliance, Built Environment Plus, and the Boston Chapter of the International Facility Management Association. Um, just a reminder that we are recording this session and that your registration and attendance includes your consent to the BSA's image and content release policy. We will also be sharing the session later in the week for you to access on architects.org and you'll be notified once, the, once this is posted online. If you would like to receive continuing education today or a certificate, please fill out the Google form which will be posted in the chat shortly. So this session is, uh, and the whole series really, is aimed around building the will around existing buildings among all constituents by investigating the hurdles and the benefits to, exi to existing building work. And in doing this, we can really determine what we need as owners, builders, architects, and advocates to embrace existing buildings as many things, but especially as climate solutions. Today, we'll speak about several K-12 schools, both public and charter, and the many different forms that existing building projects can take. So I'm gonna introduce all of our speakers before we get started here. Um, first, we'll hear from Gary Brock, an associate at HMFH, who will begin with a brief look at HMFH's Cambridge Ringe and Latin School renovation. Um, then the Bristol Aggie team, Sunny Dillard, associate at HMFH Architects, and Adele Sands, superintendent and director of Bristol County Agricultural High School. And the Bridge Boston team, Beth Cressley Goldstein, president of the Board of Trustees for Bridge Boston Charter School, and James Liebman, senior associate at HMFH Architects. Then we will move on to the Elliott School, where we'll have Rebecca Berry, principal and president of Feingold Alexander Architects, Christopher Lane, principal at Feingold Alexander Architects, and Tracy Walker Griffith, principal at the Elliott Innovation School. So with that, let's begin, and I will pass it off. Hi, uh, it's Gary. Um, thanks for having us uh, in this program. Uh, we're looking forward to sharing what we have. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, and uh, hopefully you can all see that. Uh, I'm going to go quickly. We're covering three schools for HMFH, partly because there's uh, some interesting aspects to all of them uh, related to um, existing buildings. Um, we're gonna start with Cambridge Ringe and Latin. Uh, it's a school we did a while ago. Um, and it was uh, essentially a uh, building envelope building system renovation. Uh, but what's really important, I think, for all of these projects is the, the owner. And in the, in the case of Cambridge, uh, the city had already been coming out with their climate action plan and um, really thinking about what they wanted to do in the city, and they also wanted to address existing buildings. So Ringe and Latin kind of came out of that, you know, near term, out of that process, having gone through in the city. And it also came kind of on the cusp of the MSBA starting to fund more sustainable features in projects. So there had just been the Green Schools Initiative and a study from that that were more pilot schools to see what they could do. Um, so anyway, Cambridge had some uh, an agenda for making their building uh, more sustainable. And essentially, this is a 400,000 square foot building. It's an important building in town, 
And they really didn't have another place to go, didn't really need to go. It was about their systems being at the end of their life and they really needed to upgrade it, having a, a facility that was built in the past with less efficient envelope aspects. And then of course we were dealing with a certain budget. So there was only so much we could do as well. Um, So it was mostly windows, roofing, and systems. And then there were some strategic surgical renovations as we went through the project. But it was an occupied renovation, and it was phased uh, over a period of time. So that added to the complexity and you know what could and couldn't be done at various times. The exterior walls were left as they were as far as insulation value. So we didn't really add more insulation to the exterior walls. Um, but we did improve the roof and we did improve the building systems. Um, so not just on the building system size, but there are other sustainable features that add to the sustainability of the project. Um, the systems we use because of the existing building and the limitation of what we could put in uh, for mechanical systems, we used chilled beams, which was new at, or at the time for public school facilities. Um, there was uh, some renewable energy put in, there was small cogen put in, uh, all of this in an effort to make the building uh, more uh, energy efficient. And the other thing that's important uh, is the city actually tracks their energy use. So we can kind of see what we had predicted for energy consumption for engine Latin and how it's actually been performing over the years since they instituted the tracking requirements in the city. So there's a little bit of a gap from when the, the building was completed to when they started tracking it, but it actually kind of aligns with the predictions of the energy consumption. And it also just highlights that, you know, running the building is just as important as getting it designed in the first place and making sure that it meets the performance expectations. So this is sort of an intro on a base kind of improvement to an existing building. And uh, now I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Sunny and Adele for Bristol Aggie. Okay, well, I'm going to start because Bristol Aggie is absolutely a unicorn in education. And we're very proud of that fact. Bristol Aggie sits on 250 acres, including the Taunton River. We, are, we were started with an act of legislation in 1912. And this school was started by a man, George Gilbert and his wife. And it started off as a school where young men who weren't doing very well in school could come and become farmers. Over the course of the last hundred plus years, the school has developed into uh, actually a, we say, it's a school of science and it is. It, that's not a part of what we do, it's everything we do. Our students take um, post-secondary courses in science, in, sci in the sciences, uh, including entomology, soils, um, uh, plant biology. We also work with outside agencies like US Fisheries and Wildlife uh, rehabbing extinct animals. So our students are doing postgraduate work with outside organizations like U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife, like Mass Fisheries and the Oxbow Institute. We have, um, we have environmental engineering. So when you talk about students being conservationists, uh, this isn't a piece of who we are. This is who we are. Our students um, know to, that they start with, when they're finished lunch, they start with separating pig food and compost and recycling. And then the very last goes to uh, the landfill, which is very small amount. And it was really important given who we are that our first building ever, Gilbert Hall, would not be torn down. We had new buildings going up. There's never been a, a new build on the on the campus. So it was very important for us to be heard that our school is a center for science and the environment. And we wanted Gilbert Hall to be part of that, not a new build, but a renovation. We sit on the Taunton River. Our students work on the Taunton River. 
uh, our environmental engineering students collaborate doing water quality testing for the town of Taunton. Um, so I'm going to let Sunny talk about all of this, happy to answer uh, questions, but it was really critical for us to be heard about the fact that we're not your average high school. Our students do something, do things that nobody else is doing in the Commonwealth. Oh, and we do working dairy, and we're the only school in New England and in most of the country, only high school that has a working dairy. You can tell that there's a there's a lot going on in Bristol and it's really hard to uh, say a little about it. Um, so we could just keep going, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about the project and the process. Uh, my name is Sunny Dillard. I'm an associate at HMFH. Um, I, you can tell that Adele is so engaged and uh, she and the teachers have been some of the most engaged clients we've ever worked with. And um, they, they were really champions for the integration of sustainability into our design and for the design solutions um, to be um, educational opportunities too. So um, each building on campus uh, was designed to be a champion for a specific sustainability measure. Um, but today I'm primarily gonna talk about Gilbert Hall. Um, because this is a campus project, uh, it, we had to make sure that all of the existing buildings supported and drove the design of the new just as much as the new supported the existing. Um, carbon wasn't a specific goal for Gilbert Hall or the campus. Uh, that said, we have three wood uh, framed structures on camp or as a part of the design, uh, but resource use was an important theme for this project. Some buildings, water and energy, Gilbert Hall, primarily materials. Um, we wanted to make connections through de the design to the carbon cycle and our role as humans in the cycles, in these cycles. Um, so our systems were exposed and um, wherever we weren't able to create uh, any sort of visual cue for a learning opportunity, we created educational graphics to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our uh, sort of existing site analysis of the the campus, uh, like Adele said, it's a 250 acre working farm. You can see there were many cultivated fields. You can see how close they are to the Taunton River. Um, and with that, the 100 and 500 year flood boundary. Um, the campus is also split by a major road. So you can see, um, this is the zoom in of where we actually ended up doing work. Uh, there's the work is split between North and South campus and there's center street that's in between. Um, most of the buildings on the South Campus are reuse or reno are renovations um, and one new construction. Uh, North Campus, they will uh, primarily new construction. Um, there, there are multiple ag agricultural vocational disciplines um, and this design sought to uh, integrate each discipline with their related academic programs and bring their resources closer to the, the teaching facilities. There's a, a spine that connects the, the buildings, new, existing, and across the campus. Gilbert Hall is about a 75,000 square foot academic building uh, mirrored on the North Campus. There's the CSE, which is the 75,000 square foot science building. Programmatically and educationally, it was a good fit to reuse Gilbert Hall, uh, and it was less expensive than demolition. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, an aerial photograph of South Campus. You can see the larger building on the right of the screen is Gilbert Hall. Um, Bristol Aggie took really, takes really great care of their buildings and they're in excellent condition. Um, you can see the, the middle building there is the, the original Gilbert Hall, which is built in 1938. Um, next slide, please. Um, our goal was to reuse these buildings as much as possible. So um, mostly, oh, we missed the slide, but I'll just keep going. Um, the, uh, you can see the top side that was existing Gilbert Hall. We, um, we were upgrading the envelope for efficiency and aesthetic. We added the stone to the plastered base to tie into the stone walls on campus and to match the aesthetic of the new building. We also upgraded their windows. Um, next slide, please. The in Oh, sorry. Here's the stone and the, the beautiful new windows. Um, the interior was uh, upgraded. Uh, we added insulation to all of the exterior walls and to the roof. Next slide, please. 
because Bristol-Aggie takes such good care of their buildings, um, we tried to uh, reuse the structure as much, much as possible too. Um, and as Adele said, um, Ed, Gilbert Hall was uh, such a such a valuable piece of the history. Um, it was interesting to see how much it was added on to even before we got to it. Um, so we, we had masonry bearing walls with timber floor and roof construction. We had bar joists with tectum roof deck. We had steel trusses at the large span areas in the gym and the attic. And we also had a waffle slab. Um, next slide, please. So with all of these different uh, structural types, we, we weren't able to uncover them from the very beginning. So we had to really think quickly to solve problems that were uncovered during construction. Um, and we needed to see all of the exposed systems to really complete coordination, uh, especially with the waffle slab you'll see on the next slide. Um, we were upgrading the mechanical, electrical and plumbing systems. So the ability to hang all of these systems within all of those different structural types uh, sometimes required structural upgrade Sometimes it meant rearranging some of our design strategies so that we could work with the, the waffles and, and be able to core through them appropriately without adding a bunch of additional steel or other members to make the building work. Um, Gilbert Hall, uh, because of the, the tall windows also dictated the kinds of systems that we were putting into the building. Um, we also wanted to maintain as much floor space as possible so that you could have larger classroom spaces. So it, though, the Science Center has displacement ventilation as their uh, main air supply. Uh, we used induction units at Gilbert Hall. Next slide, please. So in addition to all of the MEP upgrades or structural upgrades and envelope reuse, um, it was important to keep the original character of Gilbert Hall. So we kept uh, as much millwork detail as possible. This is a photo of the, the main entry of Gilbert Hall. Next slide. And outside of the, the main entry, there are these beautiful granite steps that we had sort of rebuilt and, and reset. Um, next slide, please. And then one of the, the one of the floors of the, the building had this beautiful uh, wood. So we had it refinished and sort of patched where needed. And it's, it's gonna be really, really beautiful. Um, as you can see, it's not quite done yet. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the one of the other big elements is the gym. We had uh, lots of debates about whether or not we would build new or keep the existing. Um, it's a pretty small gym, but um, regulation size. So uh, we we worked pretty hard to to keep their existing gym, uh, but make it feel like new. So you can see we've taken down the um, acoustic ceiling and exposed all of the trusses, so it feels larger and more exposed, even though it's not any bigger. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the last photo of the, the exterior. Um, and we really just wanted to show the new character of the campus and changing the flow and the whole team worked really hard um, to, to make it so that the, the buildings sort of stood together. And the bottom side are the new buildings, the top is Gilbert Hall and its renovation. Um, and so the, the North and South Campus Beacons are, are reminiscent of the agricultural silos that. Um, are no longer really used on the project. Um, that's Priscilla Aggie. I'm gonna pass it off now to uh, James and Beth. Hi all, um, I'm Beth Presley Goldstein and I'm the board chair of Bridge Boston Charter School. Um, we are an urban charter school, um, K to eight. And we're actually, we've, we're 10 years old and the only um, new entirely new charter school that the state has approved for the city of Boston, um, inspired by the Epiphany School in Dorchester. Um, our founders' aspirations were to create the kind of school that every child deserves, one that brings them a joyful, inclusive uh, place, rich with opportunities to learn, grow, thrive, to inspire curiosity, to inspire citizenship. Um, and so there's an element of just creating an excellent school that has all the, the wonderful things that kids should have in their school system. Then the other component is to seek to create a school that really understands the unique needs of urban students. Um, the need to come to school ready to learn um, with a full belly, with eyeglasses to see the board, hearing aids or asthma plans. Um, the school also that understands the social emotional needs of urban students 
many of whom have experienced trauma. Uh, we live in families with multi-generational poverty, among other things. So it's this blending of aspiration, but also understanding um, where our students come from. I like to think of it as a concentric circle being what a traditional public school um, or a, a traditional school might do, which is very focused on education. And we may expand a little bit out the concentric circle around our students, working with community partners to provide supports to help those students come to school ready to learn. Um, but there's a little bit more um, breadth to our offering. As such, um, we have a full day um, of services to really support the whole child. Um, as I said, it's a pre-K to eight program where most of our students are in um, Roxbury, Dorchester and Mattapan. Um, we, in addition to academics, we have a robust L-Systema-based -Systema, music program, arts, athletics. Um, we have this connection to community resources. So we're not trying to provide all the resources ourselves, but to, to connect our families to things that meet their needs. We have a robust program for students with special needs and we build really um, important relationships with the families and caregivers supporting the students. For our building project, our goal was really to find a permanent home. We like to think of our school as a second home for many of our students, a point of stability in their lives. And home was really important and an important concept. We were looking for space for our program, which we had a lot of needs, as you could hear. Um, needs for special um, specials to take place, needs to support um, the special needs of our students. Um, and it was really imperative to us that we um, be in the communities that we serve, to be a community school, to make it easier for our families to access the school day to day. It was, a six, it was six years in, in the making just to find a site. We looked at, we, lived, we were in four temporary spaces. We looked at six, eight, 10 sites in depth with enormous resources, both the board and external resources to assess them. And finally, um, we came to um, settle on the Roxbury Comprehensive Healthcare um, building, which was in receivership at the time that we purchased it. Why renovation made sense for Bridge Boston? I wish uh, that I could say that it was for sustainability reasons. I chair the board of Mass Audubon, um, but I can't say that. It was much more pragmatic than that. Um, it was really um, for us, you know, in looking at if we could have built new, that might've been less expensive. Um, it certainly would have been easier, um, but we were always in the renovation category. And that was really driven by two main things. Um, first, I've already alluded, alluded to the location. We needed to be near our students and our families. Um, we wanted to be a community-based school. We also depend on a lot of the partners around us. We're near a YMCA, a Boys and Girls Club, we're near the Boston Latin Academy and we depend on them for support for our students and families. Um, so these were um, all key components as we were looking. Um, the second piece was economic. Um, we were able to make use of um, an, an economic um, bond mechanism called QZABs. For those of you involved in the charter sector, you've probably heard about them. They're called, they stands for Qualified Zone Academy Bonds. And they're basically bonds that allow for renovation of buildings um, specifically in Massachusetts for schools um, in under-resourced communities with certain demographics. Um, those QZABs were game-changing as a, a younger school in terms of our ability to build a building and finance our debt. Um, basically, it's, they're a complicated mechanism, but the sale of tax credits from these bonds um, pretty much covers most of our annual debt service. So we're able to take all of our dollars from the state and put them into the programming that our students most need, um, as well as the dollars that we fundraise. Um, without these tax credits, we wouldn't be in our permanent building. Um, and so in some sense, the tax credits, because they're about renovation, really um, made the economics of the project work for us in a way that building new wouldn't have even if building new would have been a lower cost per square foot. Um, I'll stop there and pass it on to James to talk about the challenges and great benefits that we got from the project. So I'm, I'm James Liebman. I'm a senior associate with HMSH Architects. Thanks, Beth. Uh, so right from the beginning, uh, the first task, as Beth mentioned, was site selection. And, and I think this site 
offered two, two great things that were immediately apparent. The first was the site itself. It's a big site with the existing building taking up less than a quarter of the, the site area. And this meant that despite the building being slightly small for the program, we were able to have an addition with four classrooms and some special ed spaces, as well as a standalone gymnasium. Next slide. The second uh, immediate amenity was a skylit central space. Um, it was very clear right from the walking in that this could become the center and the, the, the sort of heartbeat of the school. Next slide. There were a lot of challenges. It was a change of use from a, a clinical uh, building with a lot of sort of uh, rabbit warren of small spaces to this educational use. And that meant the change of use meant that there was a lot of additional regulatory oversight. The building official decided that this central space was a uh, an atrium. We, we, we argued that it connected two floors, but because of how it sort of sits up against the upper floors, uh, his argument was that it connected all four. Uh, because of the smoke exhaust and other uh, rating requirements that this would require, we had to come think, think um, creatively. This happened really as construction was starting. We ended up uh, defining the tower building, the five-story tower building, as its own building from a code point of view and separating it with fire shutters and, and rated assemblies from the two-story building that wraps around it and the atrium that wraps around it. Next slide, please. As with any renovation, there were a lot of unforeseen conditions. Uh, on this project, it included water infiltration, beams that were lower and larger than existing condition drawings indicated, exacerbating uh, already low floor to floor spaces, as well as sort of a quality of original construction that was um, surprisingly poor, crumbling uh, hollow CMU uh, throughout. And, and one thing we had to rebuild, completely rebuild during construction, the, um, the elevator shafts, again, because of this crumbling CMU, as well as beams and other things sort of protruding into the existing elevator shaft. Next slide. The existing envelope also created some challenges. As you can see, there's there's not a lot of natural light or daylight openings into the building. So it was clear we needed to add quite a few. Uh, but again, because of the existing quality of construction, this was tricky. The, the uh, brick module and the CMU backup module did not align. The hollow uh, CMU inside, as well as sort of the brittle nature of the brick on the outside, meant that cutting these new openings created a uh, a new challenge uh, unforeseen during con during construction. Next slide. You can see that we did open up a lot of daylight into the spaces, uh, creating welcoming and, and and reasonable spaces for educational use, but also increasing access to views and light and uh, increasing daylight autonomy in the classrooms. It also creates kind of a, a much more welcoming and friendly facade. This is really the, the, the main commercial street, so facing the community. Next slide. The site itself slopes steeply from east to west. Um, and we, we leveraged the, uh, the new addition, as you see on the left, as well as a, a series of retaining walls to create a number of outdoor spaces, specialized outdoor spaces, for different, each for different needs and different age groups. Next slide. Um, you can see here the standalone gymnasium building on the left near the entry to the, to the renovated building creates a kind of campus feel that again, welcomes the community in. Next slide. And then the atrium space renovated to be the heart of the school. And a lot of activities happen here. Next slide. These activities can range from large sort of all school events to the um, opportunities for one-on-one -on -one learning. Next slide. We created dedicated spaces for arts and sciences. And you can tell from what Beth said that that's really critical to their mission. Next slide. As well as uh, music spaces. Uh, a, a, a dedicated music space with uh, acoustically separate practice rooms off of them. Every kid, every student takes music every day um, which is a really cool thing, but they clearly needed a dedicated space for it. Next, next slide. There's also a commercial kitchen. Um, this commercial kitchen uh, serves hot meals throughout the day during a normal school year. And last year was a, uh, a hub for or the, the center 
for a food delivery program to the community, to all the families within the community who opted in. So as you can see, uh, through this project, we were able to um, sort of bring a second life for this, uh, this building that will last for generations, as well as create a facility for Bridge Boston that lets them really live into their mission of serving the whole child. And with that, I'm gonna pass off to uh, Feingold Alexander, who's gonna tell you about the, their renovations at the Elliott School. Thank you. So we are going to talk a little bit about two buildings that are really one school, which is one of the things that makes uh, the Elliott School project a bit unique. Uh, so this is what we're gonna kind of run everyone through. Three buildings, one school, two of which we've worked on so far, the next one is hopefully coming. And then we'll move on to uh, a chance for questions and discussions about all of the projects that you've all heard about. So I'm Rebecca Berry, Principal at Feingold Alexander, and I am going to turn over really to a woman who very strongly made all of this happen, and that is Tracy Walker Griffith, the Principal of the Elliott School. Hi, friends. Um, I'm really excited to be with you today. Um, was really inspired by all of the projects that were um, shown before us. Um, this is a quick, you get to hear from me quickly because the real work was done by Feingold and Alexander. Um, I've spent the last five, almost six years with Feingold. Um, I'm a school principal and an educator for 30 years. And uh, I now know a lot more than I ever did. Um, and definitely with the running joke is the two letters VE are the worst letters in the alphabet um, in any project um, that I've been involved in. And so the two projects um, specifically in our um, experience um, as a Boston Public School, I'm one of um, 125 schools. So when we built out the, uh, the two other schools, we still stay as one school, three buildings, one super school. Um, so the projects, um, just to give you a little context and then kind of I'll let you go on to hear about the amazing work. Um, I think the biggest lift that came as a, as a school that was identified for school closure um, that's the Charter School, uh, Charter Street building um, in the North End. And it's located in the North End. It's a 1913 building. Um, that's what Rebecca um, kind of talked about that maybe someday soon um, will be done. Um, and when I started on April Fool's Day in 2007, there were only 150 students in that site. The other two sites were just dreams. Um, and so as a, as a school community in the North End, um, the the idea was to build back a public school um, in the North End. And so we went through a turnaround. We were named one of the most underperforming schools in the state in 2007. Um, slowly but surely did a lot of work around building back this whole child and this idea of keeping the same students and building up and out. Um, and so when we decided to expand, we needed another building and we identified um, the North Bennett Street School. So we, we were expanding and simultaneously, if you hit um, a couple slides, you'll see kids in a, in a classroom that were, we were actually the North Bennett Street School, which is a, a post-secondary trade school, which is the school we renovated. We were actually sharing the building um, during some parts of the renovation between Charter Street, Salem Street and Commercial Street. Um, and I think part of, if you want to hit next slide, the idea behind having three schools or three buildings and continuing kind of the coherent educational programming experience is to ensure that that joy is at the, the foundation of every what every student is experiencing, whether they're in kindergarten or in grade eight. And so each of the sites has some overlapping uh, maker spaces because part of the work that we're doing with um, the Pedagogy of Play, Project Zero, um, and the Lego Foundation is to continue to think about what is play-based and, and um, experiential learning look like from kindergarten through grade eight. Specifically in the upper school, which is where I am now, um, this just went online in September, 2019. We haven't had a full year here. Um, we're looking forward to a full year uh, this year. 
um, at, at 585 Commercial Street. Um, but I think part of the experience in our three buildings is to ensure that students go to all three schools. Um, COVID kind of put a damper on that, but the goal as we open in September is students are using the different, um, the different areas. So, um, you know, a visual arts studio, we really wanted a gym. Um, it is the North End and, and we have like a quarter gym in the community center. Um, and then the other quarter is in the, we call the fish tank in uh, the Salem Street, which the architects will talk about. Um, but I'm super excited to just share kind of, this was as a, as a school leader, just, you know, 12 years of hard work of a community taking back a school. Um, as I said, when I came on April 1st, I was told if I didn't do something quickly, it was going to be, it was on the closure list. Um, and so, you know, it is a testament to the community um, and the commitment from, you know, not only school aged parents, but a community that wanted to ensure that all students had access to high quality education and, and using an existing building was amazing. So, um, you know, we can skip that slide and you can get to see some, some really cool, that's the old uh, Salem Street. Um, you can see the old smart board. That's how old you know that, that picture is. And then the next picture is how do you utilize all of these spaces, right? So the kids in the corner, that's a charter street, you know, finding, um, you know, the, the, that third teacher, the environment is so important and, and find Golden Alexander helped see that vision with me and the community. Um, and you can always see joy. So if you're in Boston and you want to check out some really cool spaces, I always say, come on by. Thanks, Tracy. And the, the six years of working with, with Tracy on a very unique project where it's one school, three buildings, um, is just, it was equally as educational for us as architects um, to work with you and Elliott School in seeing that goal. I, I was fortunate enough to be the project manager on both of these projects that we're going to look at, at today, um, with 173 Salem Street being the first to be renovated. Um, which presented a number of challenges that began with preserving historic building. Next slide. Uh, the existing masonry building, albeit not a historically registered building, resides prominently at the corner of Salem Street and the North Bennett Street, and is a building that contributes to the North End history. It was originally established by the Associated uh, Volunteers in 1881 as the North End Industrial Home serving immigrants within the North End. Uh, early programs taught women skills for employment, paid for them for piecework, and provided social services. By 1885, the Board of Managers formally incorporated and renamed the Institute the North Bennett School of Industrial, uh, the North Bennett Street School of Industrial Design. The building itself was comprised of multiple smaller buildings, as we can see in the graphic here, with varying levels and floor to floor heights, connected by an outward wrapper. As we can see here, the original church. Um, as a four-story building, and the two outbuildings being uh, Tileston and Greener originally weren't connected, and then there was this outer thread that connected these buildings um, along with the Shaw building, a two-story at the rear. Next slide. Like any building and program, as time moved on, programs evolved and needed to keep up with change. By the 1920s and 30s, programs had expanded to Homestone, homespun handmade crafts, power machine operated crafts and skills for jobs, watch repair, cabinet making, house framing, printing, jewelry engraving, clay modeling, accounting and bookkeeping and poster window card design. These programs continued to evolve throughout history, really contributing to the richness and the strong history of this building. This picture representing uh, one of our first tours through the building in one of the cabinet make making shops. Next slide. As you can imagine, connecting three buildings that were once separated from one another creates numerous level change issues uh, between the number of levels in the different buildings and the fact that none of the levels really lined up. Um, whether it be from the Greener and Tileston buildings flanking the main building or even within the main building where there were examples of stairs going directly into classrooms at the upper level. So the three pictures we're seeing out here is just a small portion of the amount of uh, floor variants we had to deal with when we first started working on the project. Next slide. Preserving the number of existing levels was indeed studied and we looked at many different options 
all really narrowing down to the addition of at least two or three elevators and two lifts. And after exploring the numerous layouts, it was clear that the entire building interior needed to be removed, allowing for the insertion of new floors, connecting all buildings to a common level and creating the double loaded corridor classroom arranged with an L-shaped core that respected the original building locations and their varying facades while bringing in more natural light to the 27 classrooms and enrichment spaces. So as we can see in this graphic, uh, around the perimeter is the lobby off to the left. On Salem Street to the right is the beginning of the classroom core at the ground level. And really uh, in the heart of the building or the middle is the cafeteria and this multi-purpose space, which is about where the, uh, the original church was located. Next slide. So this was truly a complete interior gut renovation, including the roof and mansard. For the most part, all wood and plaster was removed from the building. The only component saved was the existing exterior masonry walls and select interior bearing walls as needed. The basement was lowered approximately two feet to provide the necessary ceiling height for basement classrooms and support spaces, gaining essentially another whole floor of unprogrammable space previously. This downward approach allowed for the installation of continuous perimeter insulation at walls and the roof, new insulated windows, new systems comprised of ducted ventilation and perimeter ceiling mounted radiant panels. In this picture, we can see the beginning of the framing of the double height multi-purpose space in the center of the building where the original church was located and the lowered basement at the bottom of this picture. Next slide. A view of the restored and altered Salem Street and Tileston Street facades can be seen here, making note of the restored wrought iron main entry in green towards the middle bottom of the page. Um, and then the altered fenestrations on the original Tileston building on the left, where we really had the biggest challenge of floor plates coming in and hitting meeting rail of double hung windows. So this was a reinterpretation of what became a more horizontal, a more vertical celebration of the windows in coordination with the level changes. Next slide. Uh, in this composite view on the right is a view of the, the main lobby providing controlled access that was indeed required along Salem Street, along with views into the multi-purpose space beyond and below and the cafeteria beyond. On the left, a view of the light well allowing for the roof monitor up above the third level to introduce natural light into the core of the building where it once didn't exist. It is worth noting that the green paint on the wall in both of these locations really represents the delineating line of where one of the walls of the original church was located. And that's a theme that was brought from the basement up in that color. Next slide. Uh, within the ground level of the Tileston building, this, this is a view of the media center. Um, at that ground level, which provided flexible use, not just for the students and the faculty, but also for community use. There is uh, exterior access from the right-hand side of this photo um, that, that doesn't necessarily require access from the, the main lobby, but the main lobby was also set up as a control point so the building could be locked down and still allow for off hours use of this space uh, should it be necessary. Next slide. A view of a typical classroom with, within the, the Salem Street project, providing built-in storage and casework, some with sinks as needed, direct and indirect LED lighting, ducted ventilation and perimeter radiant heating panels that were really integrated around the entire exterior building perimeter within the building. So spanning the windows as well as that whole wall. A view of the multi-purpose space with views up to the lobby beyond, of the three buildings on the campus, 173 Salem Street was really the, the first that offered such a large multi-purpose type space in this capacity, emulating the, a gym without all the, the necessities of a gym, but allowing that, that use. <laughs> I know Tracy's laughing at that one. <laughs> um, and I believe these are shared by, by the three building, building group, which really gets to, you know, the, what, was designed as a cafeteria being used as a multi-purpose space, serving the ever-growing demand for flexibility within our school buildings, using every inch 
as much as possible and taking advantage of the space. And lastly, I believe this is a kid's field day because um, I recognize the shirt because I think I have one. <laughs> But this really, I mean, the kids using the numerous parks that are in the North End has to offer, I mean, with the three buildings offering the space for interior classroom-based learning, surrounding parks and neighborhoods, providing unique outdoor learning experience, spanning Boston's North End really becomes the exterior environment for this campus. And with that, we'll move on to 585. So we're gonna wrap this up with talking about 585 Commercial Street. So this building uh, was purchased by the city of Boston for potential reuse as a school while we were in the design process for 173 Salem Street, knowing that there was going to be need eventually for more space for Tracy's program, which was basically growing as fast as you could possibly imagine. So we were actually engaged with the city of Boston to do what's called a SIPR process, which is really a very fast study to determine if a building is suitable for a particular use. We determined that 585 commercial could be used for a school. It was an incredibly unique opportunity. The building sits on the harbor, okay? So this is right at the edge of Commercial Street. You can see the water there to the north of the building. And you can also see that this building had another advantage, which you cannot get anywhere in the North End. It had parking, which was a huge deal, obviously, for staff um, to try to make, you know, some accommodations for them as, as part of the program. So this building was purchased. And interestingly enough, it was actually fitted out over two summers for temporary classrooms for the expansion of the Elliott program while 173 Salem Street was being renovated. So we had three goes at um, two sets of temp renovations of the building, and then finally a full complete renovation of the building once students were able to move into Salem Street. The two buildings are remarkably similar in scale, but completely different in approach. And that is due to the fact that this building at 585 Commercial Street was originally built in the 1960s as an FDA laboratory. This is where they tested everything that came through the Port of Boston, believe it or not. So this was a concrete one-way slab building. It had originally a brick infill facade, which had been ripped off and replaced with EFIS. So the approaches at the two buildings were basically completely opposite of one another. At Salem Street, the pieces of the building that were of value was really the masonry exterior and its relationship to the North End in terms of its cultural heritage and of course its architectural history. At this building, we had a structure which was totally sound, full of embodied carbon, and we just determined that we could work with. We had an envelope that didn't make sense to keep at all. And you'll see there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. So the approach was to essentially keep the structure and the core and to demolish kind of everything else. So we had then these given parameters of three stories, 43,000 gross square feet, existing plumbing core that we had installed as part of the temporary fit out that had to remain. And we had an Eversource transformer vault within the building. If anyone ever comes to you with a project where you have a transformer vault, we would strongly advise you to walk away, but we dealt with it. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, is in this building, we have 21 total classrooms that we placed 18 general purpose classrooms, three specialty classrooms, that's part of that kind of triumvirate of uses and approaches to education that Tracy was talking about earlier. And also in this building, we have a pretty decent sized multi-use uh, um, space that largely serves as a cafeteria, but also opens up for other uses. So before we started this project, the building looked like this, otherwise known as a nondescript 1980s office building with a highly inefficient EFIS envelope. This is what it looked like from the harbor. Um, the sort of funny shape that you see attached to it was um, possibly built worse than the Bridge Boston building that we saw from HMFH. It enclosed an elevator and it, we don't even wanna talk about how it was built. Luckily, we took it off because we needed a new stair and elevator core and we needed all new programming within the building. So the ultimate, uh, layout basically of the building was again circulation around the central core we added this new stair and elevator tower you'll see it has this angle this angle happens to look straight at the bunker hills vacum bridge so that was how that angle was selected 
and there's this whole stair is glazed and it provides a, a really nice way for the students to move up and down through the building on a regular basis. And then at this first floor, we had the three special purpose classrooms, which involved technology, art, and the media center where Tracy is sitting now speaking to us. And then also this large multi-purpose space that faced the water, which is fantastic. How many people have a multi-purpose space on the Boston Harbor? This first floor is also accessible to the public with these um, other rooms able to be locked off because of course we had to comply with chapter 91 regulations. So we had to have public access to the space. The upper floors, we managed to place nine class, uh, typical purpose classrooms at each floor. And then we created these learning nooks, which were special breakout spaces that are designed to provide a little bit of relief to what is really, really a very tight floor plate and also provide for some more um, educational flexibility. And then of course, the other important part of this project was, was the fact that it was a 1980s office building and we needed it to look like a school. It needed to have identity. So the design process involved looking at many different options. Um, the city of Boston has a pretty demanding um, set of hoops that they make you jump through. And ultimately we landed on a design that we feel really embodies kind of the playfulness and the spirit of what Elliott Innovation School is trying to do. The building is very deliberately not red brick. It is meant to be clear that it is not originally of the North End. It is more about the water and the uh, environmental elements and really making that clear to students as part of the program. The color scheme idea was, was about earth, air, and water. So that's why you see these three colors, the aqua, the green, and the blue that repeat throughout the project. The other interesting thing about this project is that during design, it came in at a very high number from the estimators, and then we bid it, and it came in way low. And we had VE'd a lot of things out, hence Tracy's least favorite two letters. And we actually went back to the city and said, can we add them back in? And we did, <laughs> which was very challenging because of course we were already in construction. But we managed to do several critical things with the building uh, because we had to do seismic upgrades because of the change of use. Uh, we determined that we wanted to break the box and hit, that's why you see this sort of playful series of these triangular bays, which are also located to provide views to certain um, historic landmarks in Boston. Some of them look more at the Zakem Bridge out this side of the building, which is looking east. You can see the Const USS Constitution, which is pretty fantastic. And then of course, we also wanted to make a completely new identity for the school on the inside. So we created these very wide hallways. We created entryways at each floor outside the lobby for display of uh, student works, trophies, you know, certificates, et cetera. Uh, we deliberately exposed all of the systems in the hallways that was part of the educational aspect of the program was so that students could see and understand the systems that were put into the building. Um, and it was a very, um, economical selection. Um, we have high efficient um, rooftop units, they're packaged, and then we have a, you know, simple um, air distribution through the building, but it does provide for pretty high air quality. And all of the systems are placed out in the hallway for acoustics. So we were able to meet um, pretty stringent acoustic requirements within the classrooms, for instance, uh, under the LEED system for schools. We do also provide, again, this multi-purpose space, as you can see here, which faces the water. Um, filled with children, very active. And then we also deliberately left uh, those structural elements exposed that we needed to add for the seismic upgrades. You can see here, these are our seismic braces. We did have uh, quite a bit of work to do to do that. It involved drilling a lot of piles. Um, and because we were beside the harbor, we had to deal with issues around that, but it all worked out in the end. And we were also able to provide uh, some of these in-between spaces. So this is one of the learning nooks that you're seeing here. They are flooded with light. And we know that um, Tracy and her staff are still kind of adapting these and you know, looking at different ways to fit them out. We had very limited budget for furnishing, so we weren't able to put a lot of things in these spaces. Uh, but you know, the school continues to adapt to the program. So that was sort of two very different approaches to two buildings to try to, again, create this three buildings one school campus for, for the Elliott School. So thank you. Um, I think I will stop sharing so that we can move on to questions and discussion. Great, thank you so much. So really, really um, exciting series of projects. And was, I, I learned a lot. Um, I'm not seeing 
many questions pop up in the chat. So we have plenty to talk about, but audience members, please feel free to type in your questions if you have any, um, and we'll try to address them as we get into Q and A. Um, I guess I'll start with one question. I noticed that in many of your talks, the topic of resilience came up, um, both uh, sort of social and environmental resilience. I'm curious to know, as you think about taking these buildings from the past and transforming them for the future, how did um, resilience play into your designs? And I mean, I'd like to hear from everyone. <laughs> Well, uh, sorry, no, go I'll ahead. jump in on, on Ringe and Latin. I mean, ahead, as I said, Cambridge has kind of been um, looking at this for a while um, and trying to get a handle and they've been updating their climate action plan um, as well. Uh, so it, it's been on their minds. And I think as they've been going on, they've been trying to address what they can uh, with every project. Um, yeah, we're working with uh, the city of Boston, the the goals were not um, that aspirational. Um, however, resiliency was important to them, in particular for 585 Commercial Street, right? Because we are on the harbor. So interestingly enough, um, we did a whole bunch of studies about things like, for instance, moving the transformer up the level, which was just really prohibitive. And it turned out was not necessarily the right thing to do, frankly. Um, but what we did do, interestingly enough, is the main electrical room for the school, which is where you would actually have a lot of trouble replacing equipment if you had a flood, um, is on the second level. So that was, a, that was a very conscious decision that was made in terms of sort of climate resiliency, right, moving forward. Um, obviously, we couldn't move the first floor of the building. Um, luckily, it's actually up just high enough that we are pretty much above uh, areas of, you know, potentially really serious concern. Um, but we did do things like the backing board for um, the materials at the first floor um, is cement work, right? And we have tile kind of everywhere, right? To, to handle, to hopefully, you know, help on handling any say potential um, flood events that, that could, you know, occur at the site in, in some number of years from now. I think for Bristol IE, um, much of our resilience efforts were sort of tied in with other aspects of the project too. Like we, we really focused on social, environmental and economic sustainability and those sort of fed into different resilient strategies like putting your air handling units on the inside of the building. And so then you have more solar access and we sloped our roof. So things like that, I think it, it was more nuanced and not just very specific like climate resilient solutions. Right, and I, I'll add, I mean, much to Tracy's dismay, we don't have any air conditioning in, in Salem Street. We have operable windows. So there is a sense of resil resiliency there that you could imagine, but does it really work? Um, I know you wanted air conditioning there and it, for obvious reasons and budgetary reasons as such it wasn't, but we got it in 585 and as a result ended up with much more fixed windows than we have at at Elliot. And I'll say we didn't have the, the luxury at, at Elliot to be able to move um, systems and electrical up to the first floor because we had such a, a limited footprint for, for what we were trying to achieve. Nor did we have a lot of ceiling height in the basement to the, all, to the extent possible. Anything we could elevate, either where a curb wasn't required or we could go to a, a, a foot tall instead of your minimum four inch curb for switch gear and such, we elevated as much as we could um, to buy what we could for any flooding that, that may, may occur. We also did a, a, quite a bit of uh, Zypex injection into known, known leaks and such in the existing foundation. Again, we weren't ripping up all the sidewalks, so we couldn't put any type of perimeter drain. So any type of water we were trying to contain had to be done from the, the negative side. Are you, are you talking? <laughs> Go ahead. At, at Bridge, uh, sustainable resiliency wasn't sort of a focus. Um, obviously, from what Beth talked about, social resiliency was. The commercial kitchen that I talked about was added during construction, so that added a, a level of complication. Um, but um, 
but I will say that there was a lot of concern for longevity of the the new construction and and sort of materials longevity. Yeah, I'm really glad you bring up that social resilience piece. I think that's one thing that's so interesting, particularly about this programmatic use type is that it's really you really see those intersections of being able to withstand changes in the environment with creating that you know place for community resilience during times of hardship you know looking at the food kitchen or power outages or what have you so that was um, I like seeing I liked seeing the, all of those aspects um, you know come out in your talks okay one audience question please discuss the very initial decision period where building new versus restoring renovating is being contemplated. Are there any basic principles that can be applied? Uh, a lot of times it seems to heavily rely on the architect's viewpoint and most architects would rather build new. Any comments? I love that question. <laughs> I'll, I'll hop right in. It's a, sure. That's a fantastic question. I think, um, so from the standpoint of, of being a practice leader at a practice where most of our work is existing buildings. <laughs> I, we will say that there is there are, is often a perception that renovation is more expensive than new construction, and that is absolutely not always the case. Um, furthermore, there is value in buildings that's um, not always well accounted for in the dollars, right? So in other words, if you look at something like the Salem Street site or like the Cambridge Ridge and Latin site, right in um, in Cambridge, you know these are these are buildings that are really embedded in their community and they have a history and a and a presence, right? That um, you can't replicate, right? So, for instance, you know the history that's embedded in um, you know the years of the different types of schools at Salem Street, for instance. You know, if you built new, there would be There'd be no kind of visual or perceptual memory of that. And there is a, a cultural value to that that we often, um, I think, kind of can brush aside and, and not pay attention to. Now, that is a potentially difficult question to have with an owner uh, because they may be more focused on other things, right? And then, of course, there's the whole new discussion around embodied carbon, which, frankly, is, is kind of you know, it's on everybody's minds now, but it, I, I don't think it was probably even necessarily part of the discussion with um, the city of Cambridge. And, you know, as a Cambridge resident, I know that we've always been kind of out there, right, about our climate goals. Um, but that is also kind of a, a, a touch point and a, and a place of entry to a conversation with an owner about the value of renovation versus new construction. I can add to that from the owner's perspective. I think when you're talking about schools, you're talking about, it's not like a bank where people come and go. You're talking about alumni. You're talking about people's entire youth uh, is part is happened in a building. And so when you're talking to schools who are doing that renovation, it's very important. They've got a lot of constituents who are tied up, townspeople for us. It was great that our architects came in and really listened because we had a lot of community. I mean, you think about 80 year old farmers who went to a very different school than the school that we have right now, who were absolutely determined for that school not to look any different. So how do you, how do you do this? How do you create, how do you keep the heart of the school that they grew up in while renovating it and making it the school the students deserve today. And to, to pick up on where you left off, Rebecca, I mean, the, the, the notion that renovation is more expensive than new, it's been around ever since I started really in the, the renovation and adaptive use market, what, 20 years ago? I mean, to give away my, my age, I guess. but. The two Elliott schools, just for instance, is a complete flip-flop of that because you've got uh, in 173 Salem Street, it may have been cheaper to, to rebuild, but not where it needed, where, not where it needed to be. I mean, there was close to a million dollars spent on shoring uh, because of the amount of demo removed in there. And it, you know, an, an owner or a developer could look at that number and think that's absolutely odd crazy to spend that type of money that for supporting structures to then remove and discard 
versus 585, where what it would cost you to build that structure, that framework now new, grossly outweighs what it costs to renovate that building and put a new skin on it. So it is very unique to uh, the existing building at hand and location and, and goals. I'd like to address a little bit the, the idea that architects would prefer to build new. Um, um, it's, it's a broad statement and it has some truth to it, partially because renovations are really hard um, and to do them well is, is, is difficult. The construction phase is an absolute trudge. Um, the results are, are worth it. Um, and I think a lot of architects are coming around to that. But I also think that, you know, as architects, we've been renovating buildings for a long time. My, in a previous life, my, my first project out of grad school was a, a piece of a project where we were renovating six buildings into a brand new uh, student center for the University of Pennsylvania. They had asked us to build them a new building, but we had identified these, this um, deferred maintenance problem. Um, and that, that changed the nature of the project significantly. So there, there, are, there are a lot of opportunities for clients and for architects in renovation. I would offer any tips on moving forward um, with renovations. I think um, understanding expectations is huge, um, both from the client, from the architect, visually, aesthetically, all of that, and the contractor too. I think um, as long as you're all on the same page, uh, with how to move forward, what you're expecting, uh, what do you want to see, how you want things to work. I think the process is a lot smoother. Um, when, when your expectations don't align, I think that's where it becomes harder to renovate and harder to, to move a project forward. Great, thanks. Um, I, I just want to observe that Adele, when you're talking about saving the building because of that sense of identity and legacy that exists, um, because you're the, you owned the building before and after the renovation and kind of contrast that to the, you know, Tracy, to your schools where they, they weren't schools before and that, or, you know, many the other projects, all of them where it was a, a pretty dramatic transformation um, and how that it's both possible to do a successful renovation that does that is very deferential to the identity and past, and one that is completely transformative to turn something that you know was an FDA office building into a school. Um, that was, <laughs> I appreciate that range here. Um, okay, we have more questions. There was a follow up question. I think we started addressing this, but techniques to successfully convince stakeholders, clients, users, review boards, community members, etc who see renovation work as more difficult, expensive, you know, what have you, um, and how do topics of sustainability and embodied carbon come into the discussion? And I'll just add before others answered that I think regulation is helping us a little bit here in some ways that particularly with embodied carbon, we're just at the tip of the iceberg here with that starting to come into the, you know, the policies and regulations about construction in the way that energy use exists now. Um, so I think that that starts to help when people are, you know, forced to account for it. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm curious to hear what others think in terms of that, that persuasion piece. I think often there can be a, a time savings with reusing buildings. I, I mean, I, I can speak to Gilbert Hall mostly. Um, like there's, there's a time that's associated with having to, to, dig for foundations, to pour for foundations, to pour all of the slabs, to build the structure. And um, though there is some time to figure out other problems within the building, locating MEP and working with the existing structural systems, I think you can often save some time in reusing the building too. Granted, that's all project specific, but at least that's the case for Bristol And I, I would add to that, you have to balance how deep you're gonna go into the front end of exploratory and understanding the existing building. And how far do you go jumping over hurdles as you begin to find obstructions that are gonna, like in 5, 8, uh, 173 Salem Street, for instance, we, we, it wasn't a very large uh, campaign of historic evaluation and opening up walls, but it was enough to give us an idea of what we were running up, that what we were gonna run up against on top of the levels issue. So it, as much as you, it's really just 
kind of this fine line as you're beginning to go down that road before you decide you're going to do an entire intrusive investigor, investigatory package up front and what the cost is to that for the owner to do that to end and uh, end up with a uh, kind of a compromise in what the end goal is. So really understanding that and establishing that that right on the beginning is, has a lot to do with where you may end up. We talk a lot about programmatically whether or not reusing a building is going to make sense too. And I think um, the flexibility of program spaces, both from the client and the architect, being able to be creative enough with the existing building to figure out how they can make that program work is also kind of a, a give and take. And I think that sort of ties into Lisa's question about flexibility and whether or not uh, we are designing for flexibility. And um, I think it's important to to make spaces that aren't necessarily 100% flexible, but have the ability to flex uh, a little bit. I think there was a, um, a talk with lab buildings and, and if you make an entire lab building capable of holding very specific lab uses 100%, then you're sort of designing for a, like a crazy amount of flexibility that could be excessively expensive. But if you find one portion of your building that could be designed to be incredibly flex flexible and the other can just be sort of toilets or offices or, or whatever, then you're doing a better service for any sort of reuse in the future too. Yeah, yeah this, this question, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, James. This, this question of um, how do you convince your clients? Well, some of it is regulatory and, and, and you know, how, how we uh, talk to our, our politicians. The tax credits that Bridge really was based on, again, that was a project, that was a renovation before it was a project. Um, the tax credits that that was based on are, um, have expired in the last administration. We, we think they're coming back, we hope they're coming back, but, um, you know, that's a big part of the, 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 the financial equation, obviously, is a big part of how you talk to clients about a renovation. Yeah, and on the, on the question of kind of flexibility and spaces and, and looking at what you can do within an existing building, um, you may have, have noticed that, you know, the, so at 173 Salem Street, again, and 585 Commercial Street, right? We were only 42,000 to 43,000 square feet, which, you know, folks who are school architects will recognize those are really small, right? Like it's tight. And Tracy really dug in with us and got super creative. And even, you know, what, what I recall was the biggest kind of back and forth too, Tracy, was like, as we were doing the projects, you were, you know, your school was changing. And so you were trying to kind of imagine like, what was going to happen once you had, you know, 400 more students and, and where was the best place to put the grades? I mean, the grade mix was changing as we were designing. And so there's, there's like the flexibility in the building, but then I think there's also like flexibility in thinking among all of us, right? Like the whole design team, you know, from the, the owner, the educators, us, you know, we have to be really open and honest with each other. Um, and that's probably no matter the program, in particular, when we've got you know, we have a box, right? Or you have a, a fixed site, even like a, a tight site, right? That you have to work within and figure out the best way to problem solve. So there's, there's just, I think, kind of like a, a, in some ways, a different way of thinking that's involved that doesn't say, well, you know, these are the standards for X type of space or X type of use, right? We have to kind of get a little bit out of that mindset and think about what are the possibilities that, that we haven't come to before that could support this use that might happen in a different type of space or in a different way. I, I, that's great, thank you. I'd love to hear from Tracy and Adele about this actually, when you're thinking about these capital projects, which you hopefully only do every you know, 30, 40, 50 years, how do you think about the program and how you're changing the building to support both what you need now and also what you see coming down the road? Um, maybe start from Tracy. Sure. Um, so Rebecca kind of talked through when we first started the expansion, we were expanding with no buildings, right? So we were dreaming, you know, like you add more kids knowing that something's going to have to happen. Um, and knowing that the current building that I'm standing in, which is the latest 585 was actually earmarked for another whole school. Um, and so 
our campaign was, you know, we already have, you know, a number of students and we could continue to grow. Um, and so we had to, once we said it would be an Elliott school, then they said, well, it'll be a, for the littles, right? And this is close to all of the, this is through public transportation. There's a tennis court, there's a skating rink. I don't think three and four-year-olds and five-year-olds really need access to this kind of space. So kind of thinking about, you know, I'm like a dog on a bone, right? This was, this is all for kids, right? We have jobs for kids. And so let's think about our children. This is like one of the big, busiest streets. Um, you know, the older students should be here. So just even thinking about the shifting of the, the program and the project, because the impact, obviously, I didn't understand about like the toilets and all of those things. Um, those were a big piece in, you know, we're designing two buildings. So it was really important for us as a school community to be continuing to be partners, but also kind of, I mean, I, they obviously know that I'm kind of pushy, um, so that it was, it was necessary to engage at a high level, but also on a ground level, like, is this right for kids? Um, because, you know, sitting in a building talking about what does the skin color look like or the, you know, the skin of the building, um, all these new things that I was learning, bottom line was what made sense for the students at that level and then the spaces. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, it's great. Absolutely. Thanks. Adele, what about you? Fortunately, our architects had our students involved in it from the very beginning. So the not only were the adults involved in the design of all of this, the students were too. All of these students, um, their programs, they were part of this. And one of the things that I think really mattered to us because it's almost impossible to design for the future because you really don't know what the future looks like. So we talk about designing for the future, but what we're really designing is for the people who are going to create the future. The people who are in our buildings, those are the people who are going to hopefully save this planet and save all of us. And so that's really what I think the architects got to with us was that we have high school students and we want to create a space that will allow them to actually see everything. They see all, all of the equipment, everything is available for them to see how the building runs and what we do, but also just spark their imaginations. And we're an odd school. I mean, we really are. We, uh, we have labs that have turtles in them. We have, um, we have endangered species all through our schools. We have all sorts of protections involved. And so we, I think what they really tried to do is say, what, how, what can we design that isn't limited to the next 10 years? What can we design that will spark the student's imagination to be the people who can do what we need from them in the next 40 years? That's great. Thank you. Um, we have about eight minutes left. Do any of the panelists have questions for each other? Well, I have one comment about school buildings in general. I mean, we're talking about some unique projects where the owner is just dealing with one building or one campus and they're kind of managing that. But when you're dealing with some other municipalities that are dealing with multiple buildings across the whole community, um, sometimes there's a disconnect between planning for capital costs and what to do and those that are involved with operating it and running it. And there needs to be more connection with that and more thinking about that. And uh, that can help in, in general, whether it's for a new building or for an existing building. But uh, th that disconnect can kind of get in the way of making some good decisions at the design time. Gary, are you talking um, sort of both about the, um, the sometimes the the lack of linkage between an operational budget and a capital budget yes. and yeah so right the fact that like one department for instance holds like the operational budget right mm -hmm. and then one department holds the capital budget and capital says i've only got 
$10 million to spend on this. And I don't care what it costs to operate the building. And the operators are saying, well, I've only got so much a year, right? And why would you build a building that the electrical bills are going to be high, right? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big part of it. And, and sometimes these decisions in, in many communities are, are being made by, uh, you know, people that are on voluntary committees. So they right. they haven't been dealing with this very often. And it mm -hmm. sometimes involves communicating, you know, they may be all on the same page, but the rest of the community or town needs to be brought up to that. So there's a lot of communication mm -hmm. that needs to happen, both across those departments, as well as in the community at large. And that just makes it the process in general challenging. And I can say for, for schools like mine, I have 16 towns and four cities that have to choose, they all have to vote to do a project like this. And so, yeah, it's not, it's, it's fairly expansive what has to happen in order to get this to work. So you're trying to get 16 towns and four cities to agree to pay for one school. Any other final uh, observations, thoughts from the panel? I guess so. I, I might just chime in that one of the things that has been, you know, a topic of conversation at the BSA, and we know, of course, within the various other um, affiliated groups like Built Environment Plus, et cetera, is the potential for, you know, the new zero carbon code and also for kind of advocacy around, um, let's just say kind of bumping up the approach to schools specifically, right, when it comes to um, their carbon usage. Um, so that's just something that, uh, you know, we see as a, as a kind of an ongoing conversation and something that in terms of, you know, regulations or in terms of goals, having more stringent regulations and having goals at the state level, you know, specifically from the state funding agency that are more in line with things like um, the executive orders, which many of us work under for other projects with DCAM. Uh, would be probably helpful to this conversation around looking at reusing buildings for schools around embodied carbon, but also in terms of thinking about operational costs, system choices, et cetera, uh, as we move forward. And just to add to that, I think uh, whether it's regulatory or just uh, communities making decisions, data is important and having the information yeah. is important. And you know, sometimes putting the cart before the horse can get you in trouble. Um, you know, the, just as an example too, we're using more energy modeling to understand what we're predicting our buildings will do. We need to know if the buildings are actually performing that way. Um, we are getting into this carbon, embodied carbon side of things. Um, there currently isn't, um, you know, an agreed upon baseline that people are referencing for determining that improvement level. So there's a lot that needs to happen on an ongoing basis and initially to make sure we're starting from the right point. I think I'll just say one more thing to add to what Gary said. If um, collecting data is a big part of that. So just doing yeah. the analysis is the first start for all of us, whether it's regulated or not, um, both in terms of embodied and operational carbon. And starting to use the, the CLF Carbon Leadership Forum uh, baseline tools, we could start there. Yep. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks to all of the speakers. This was really a wonderful, both presentations and discussion. Um, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. And of course, another thank you to our sponsor and to all of our partners. And a reminder that the series continues next week with a session on mission-driven workplaces and a conversation with Greentown Labs and Silverman Tchaikovsky Associates. So please join us then. Um, and if you haven't been able to make any of the past sessions, they are available online as this one will be um, by the end of this week. So please continue to, to join us. Thanks again for attending everyone. Thanks, Lori. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thanks for hosting, Lori. <laughs>